Every year on the EASD programme, we have a couple of debates and they are always fiercely contested contests of will and passion. And the particular debate that we have at the moment to talk to you about is insulin-free type 2 diabetes is coming. But the other side says it's nonsense. So let me introduce you to the protagonists in this debate, plus their long-suffering chair. So first of all, arguing that actually it's nonsense, we have uh, Bruce Wolfenbuttel from the University of Groningen. And then, obviously on an equal footing, at the moment, uh, we have Apostolos Tsapas from Aristotle University in Thessaloniki and the chair, the long-suffering chair, the one who must make the wisdom of Solomon and come down between them is Leszek Czuprinak, head of the Department of Diabetology at the University of Warsaw and a firm EASD favourite, I might say. So, who is going to go first? Bruce, I think you should, because you say that this is all nonsense. There will be no insulin-free type 2 diabetes treatment. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I'm Why? afraid that, well, type 2 diabetes is a combination of people having insulin resistance and a poor insulin secretion by the pancreas. And when people get diabetes, the beta cell function already has diminished by 50% and it goes worse over time. So if you live long enough, you will go to insulin. Now we know that there are subtypes of people with type 2 diabetes and there's a fraction of people, it's about 25%, who are characterized by being insulin deficient. So the only logical treatment for them is insulin replacement therapy. Only if you're obese, you may postpone insulin treatment by losing weight. And we have new medication that can do the job. But in the end, after 15 to 20 years of type 2 diabetes, people will need insulin replacement therapy as a logical consequence of the natural history of their disease. So Bruce is saying insulin is inevitable. What do you think? Yeah, indeed. I mean, uh Insulin is uh, one of the major uh, drugs that we're using for treatment of type 2 diabetes. But it has very significant drawbacks. So use of insulin is associated with a significant body weight gain. And if you compare that to novel agents that are these days available, we know that GLP-1 receptor agonists, for example, they reduce body weight by a significant amount of kilograms. And if you think, for example, also of hypoglycemia, we know that insulin is associated with a significant incidence of hypoglycemia, which is quite important because it's associated with increased mortality. And on the other hand, one might argue that people, uh, that insulin uh, reduces HbA1c much more than the novel options, which is not the case because we know that GLP-1 receptor agonists can reduce HbA1c much lower than insulin. And th in fact, this has been shown to be durable in the long term in a series of trials and post-trial observations where we see that people who are on other pharmaceutical therapy rather than insulin, we, they do lower HbA1c for longer and much more efficiently compared to people who are using insulin. We are living in a universe which is outcome-centered. We're not any longer in an HbA1c, in a glucocentric universe. So I think at the end of the day, we have also to think of the effect of treatment on other non-glycemic outcomes like cardiovascular mortality or chronic kidney disease. So we know that novel agents have a fantastic effect on these outcomes. And I think it's important to think of these outcomes as well. And at the end of the day, we know that just around the corner, there are novel therapies that are coming. They have been tested in patients with type 1 diabetes. Bruce mentioned, for example, mentioned the problem of insulin deficiency. But we know, for example, 
that island transplantation is a very efficient treatment in type 1 diabetes and we know for example that there are stem cell derived islets that are now being tested in patients with type 1 diabetes which combined with CRISPR technology can offer a viable option in patients. We hope that these will be available for type 2 diabetes in the future. In the meantime, we know that other options like bariatric surgery, like uh, metabolic endoscopy, they are viable, they are associated with a reduction in HbA1c and body weight, and at the end of the day, which I think is also important from a societal perspective, they are com uh, cost effective when compared with insulin treatment. Now, let's check if I can summarize this argument so far. Uh, Apostolos seems to be saying that actually insulin has had its day and if you're preventing people getting diabetes then that's the way to go and there are all these other new technologies coming along. Whereas Bruce is saying that actually for at least a quarter of your diabetes uh, patients they're going to become insulin deficient and you're going to get there anyway. Where do you fit in this argument? Well. The aim of making this debate is to draw people's attention that actually we are seeing a major shift in the treatment algorithm and insulin which we love, we all love insulin, we love using it in patients and, and basically insulin treatment is something which defines a diabetologist. One of the definitions of diabetologist is this is a physician who uses insulin on a daily basis and is not afraid of using it as a drug. So on one hand we love it, but on the other hand with the arrival of all new technologies, uh, clearly there will be a change. Will be and I guess we all agree we'll be starting insulin in type 2 diabetes later because the new drugs may delay it. And also what we see from the studies that both SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP receptor agonists, they are able to decrease the insulin requirement by half. Uh, so perhaps if we use these new drugs more or at higher doses or earlier, we might totally delay insulin treatment. But of course, we are also undergoing the change in understanding what type 2 diabetes is. And there will be new subtypes more officially arriving in coming years, I believe. And yeah, sure, there will be people like Bruce mentioned who uh, will need insulin rather sooner than later. But perhaps this is not the type 2 diabetes we understand it as we understand it today. We really associate it with obesity, with insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction as a somehow the secondary thing to, to beta cell being unable to compensate this insulin resistance. But clearly there is a subgroup of people uh, who are different and they will take insulin whatever happens. But perhaps they are not really type 2. Maybe there is something totally new type we'll learn. But we are undergoing the change, and I guess we are all agree. And I sometimes say, just to make the argument more provocative, that if any company tried to register insulin today for type 2 diabetes treatment, they would have a hell of a lot of problems. It caused hypos, increase in body weight, and no effect on cardiovascular mortality. So probably, it might not even be licensed to be using type 2. On the other hand, indeed, some people do need it. But we also live longer. We also live yeah. longer. And the longer the other you live with bit diabetes, of the, you need the it. equation yeah. here that we absolutely must not forget is that people who live with diabetes, for them, they would really rather not take insulin. They would really rather not be injecting every day. So they perhaps might wish for an insulin free future. Yeah, well, we all agree that an insulin-free future would be ideal, but it's it's science um, fiction, it's not reality. And it has to do with several things. One is that um, insulin is often used too late. So uh, if people are already in poorer control already have complications, for instance. Insulin early in the disease can be used sometimes by doctors, I have to admit, as a threat. If you don't adhere to your diet, you will get to insulin. So people, are, people with diabetes are fearing insulin. And often they have a neighbor or a family relative who had consequences of their diabetes during insulin treatment, but not caused by insulin treatment. That's one thing. Um, 
on the other thing, uh, my opponent gives a, a couple of examples of the future, but islet transplantation is not realistic for everyone with type 1 diabetes at the moment. Let aside people with type 2 diabetes. But I think we agree that there are medications that can help, especially the 75% who are not purely insulin deficient but resistant to overcome insulin resistance to reduce body weights. Now, insulin is not very difficult, but we can make it as difficult as it is. And of course, insulin treatment may cause hypoglycemia. And the reason um, that um, it can cause hypoglycemia is how we are using it. Insulin is used on the, the, the wrong place. You're injecting it by a subcutaneous administration. It not goes through the liver like native insulin is doing. And you can mimic or you can minimize the risk of hypoglycemia by multiple daily injections, by frequent um, monitoring of blood glucose, which is not very popular for people with diabetes. But now with new devices like continuous glucose monitoring, insulin therapy can be administered very safely, both in people with type 1 and in people with type 2 diabetes. But let me repeat it again, at least a quarter needs insulin within the first five years. And even if you're obese and you have 25 years of type 2 diabetes, your pancreas will be exhausted. So unless my opponent has a real good pancreatic pacemaker, insulin replacement is physiological replacement and maintains normal glycemia in people. So he seems to be making a killer argument here. <laughs> How would you respond yeah. to that? I mean, presumably you could stratify people much, much earlier, you know, do mass screening and that would get you to perhaps your insulin-free future. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I do see Bruce's uh, arguments and uh, his one must uh, admit that in, in an idealistic world where, I mean, everyone would be using CGM and insulin would be used under ideal uh, conditions indeed it would be a viable option but that's never going to happen but that's never going to happen exactly so results both from rcts which have in fact limited external validity but are there with the highest internal validity as well as from observational studies which is real world they underline the fact that insulin use no matter what regimen you are using no matter how you use that is associated with body weight gain with hypoglycemia. I know that in an argument, in a debate, a half full glass can be presented you know, as full or empty, depending on the perspective. But being in Stockholm, I have to remind you that Dr. Banding, when received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of insulin, he underlined that fact, the fact that insulin should not be regarded as a cure, but rather as a treatment. I think almost 100 years after that, we have to be arguing for an insulin-free treatment of type 2 diabetes. And of course, you can't argue with that. So Leszek, just sum up for us why people should come to this debate, because it seems to me perhaps actually more finely balanced than, than you might suppose. Well, the people should come to our debate just to have full view, full perspective on the dilemmas we are facing today, having RCT's result on one hand with new medications and 100 years of history of insulin usage on the other hand. And we have, as Apostolos, uh, as both the, the, my colleagues and friends said, uh, we have a very strong ally in discussing this issue, who are the patients. Uh, I've just met one or two patients who really asked for insulin having type 2 diabetes. Most of them are really afraid of, for the reasons Bruce so elegantly listed. So it is still an important issue, becoming more controversial with the arrival of new technologies not just drugs but also CGMs so if anyone feels confused and thinks okay forget insulin in type 2 or no no you mustn't forget it because it's the foundation of every diabetes treatment uh, let them come to the debate and see all the sides of the coin and then think of yourself for yourself or your patients Thank you so much, uh, all three of you, and do go and have a listen to that debate because I think that you'll find it very stimulating. And as Leszek says, it gets more controversial by the year.